Heels welcomes you to the third Euro Symposium on Healthy Aging. Heels is the largest non-governmental organization in Europe promoting and advocating scientific research into longevity and biogerontology. Thanks to generous support from our sponsors, Heels was able to organize this conference. The conference will highlight the cutting edge of knowledge in the field of biogerontology and provide a unique opportunity for researchers, government officials, biotech executives and advocates from around the world to meet, network and forge new scientific collaborations. During the last two days, we have talked a lot about the basic biology of aging. But, you know, as uh, David already uh, mentioned, we are not interested in extending the health and lifespan of C. elegans, but we are interested in extending the health and lifespan of humans. So the, the main topic of this, or the only topic of this debate really is on how are we going to achieve that? How are we going to translate this basic science to the clinic? And um, there are, roughly speaking, two main questions here. One is a technical question, how are we going to prove that a treatment that works in C. elegans actually also works in humans, or you know, probably will you work in humans? And the second is, you know, what about regulation, or can we bypass regulation? We, that we will discuss as well. Okay, so um, then I will start with my first question. So, and the first question basically, um, uh, is um, really, you know, um, it's impossible uh, to do a 30 year long lifespan study on humans. So what other approaches would the panel take to prove that the therapy will likely be effective in humans? Okay, I will start with a few examples and it will be completed. So the standard approach by the pharmaceutical industry is to pick a disease and uh, not to work on prevention because it's too long, too costly, um, and to see if uh, the molecule or the, the, the treatment uh, works. Um, so that's uh, the standard approach. And uh, here there is no major hurdle. Uh, you need uh, investments because it's uh, expensive. You need uh, the pharmaceutical industry and I would say it's commercial power uh, to have the solution not only approved by the authorities but all rather uh, delivered uh, to the patients, to the people. Uh, right? Uh, if we want to go faster, of course, we, uh, we can do uh, animal, uh, like mouse testings, but that's not humans. Uh, and we can do a data analysis, but that's not humans, um, right? Um, so maybe uh, there is a, if we are really talking about how to get it to humans in the end, some alternatives have been developed um, that are for now quite uh, um, unsure, but, but uh, one of them is to, uh, is to simply um, let some sort of um, black market develop. I will, uh, uh, today we had the example of C60, uh, for which no lifespan increase in mice was found. Uh, there was a big, big hype, or, or, or maybe it's true, we, you know, science is not uh, obvious. Um, and uh, uh, following a paper with uh, life extension in C60, um, a lot of uh, startups started to sell it everywhere. Uh, so if further results would come, there would be a sort of black market. Um, and other people are trying to uh, work uh, themselves on organizing some, uh, um, some friendly uh, committees, uh, like uh, uh, inf informal um, um, clinical trials. I'm thinking of desatinib and carcetin, for example, for sen senolytics. Or even metformin, we have a lot of people who are starting to take metformin even though they don't have diabetes for which it's prescribed. So uh, what we see is we have the standard way and we have the non-standard way. Um, and in the end, uh, probably the non-standard way will go through a standard way, uh, but it's a way to force a little the authorities uh, to go faster. Yes, because your informal approach will not actually prove that therapy works. 
it will be purely, you know, reports of individual people claiming to have improvements in health. Um, <clears throat> in April, we made a workshop, we organized a workshop in, in Oxford um, on behalf of Biogerontology Research Foundation uh, for the Ministry of Health of Kazakhstan. And uh, there were Gian and David, as I remember, at that word, workshop. So uh, <clears throat> the idea of workshop was uh, creation of a national program uh, for the Kazakhstan uh, country and um, creation of state-of-the-art uh, hub where we'll be focused on longevity and regenerative medicine. And uh, within that uh, workshop, we uh, made kind of investigation. Uh, so how we will show for the, uh, for the government of, of the country that uh, we can produce something really uh, tangible. And uh, the first uh, question was to create a list of um, biomarkers, so uh, biomarkers of aging, and uh, uh, to test them, to, to using them, using that list to analyze uh, really in speed mode, in uh, skunk mode, uh, what is working not, and what is not working. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, there were uh, offered some novel approaches. Let's say they're maybe not so novel, but at, but at least they were clarified how they should be assembled in one uh, meta system. So first, uh, it was kind of creation of kind of uh, digital avatars for each patient uh, based on his... Uh, uh, based on uh, advanced uh, diagn diagnostics and also uh, the visualization of all that combined data, uh, all that uh, combined biomarkers. <coughs> and it, it was supposed that in silicon medicine, uh, you short presentation, some of, of the, that uh, work in the silicon medicine by, by Quentin Van Halen, yes, today. <coughs> so they, they are doing deep learning and uh, different kind of machine learning artificial intelligence to analyze uh, big list of uh, different biomarkers. Second uh, tool was um, using uh, tomographs, so mice, but we've installed uh, uh, cells from uh, humans, and not just, uh, just average humans, but uh, specifically from concrete patient. F uh, f concrete patient and uh, testing in that uh, mice, uh, different uh, uh <coughs> protectors or different drugs and, and so on. Next stage was uh, using skin of the patient as the testing bed, as the testing platform uh, to, again, to, to test different drugs, but uh, specifically in uh, uh, ecosystem which uh, belongs to specific patients. So this is, uh, this is the roadmap, this is the strategy how uh, apply zero protectors and uh, different uh, drugs and different technologies, but specifically tuned for concrete patient. So this is kind of personalized and precision medicine. So in, in my view, it also has something to do with urgency. Like for example, when there's a pandemic and people need to react quickly, then, of, then suddenly you see that um, regulations may be relaxed and that um, everyone, including regulators, researchers, are doing all the efforts that um, new potential therapeutic candidates will um, come in, uh, onto market and will be available on patients. So that's one issue I see that's also not that much the urgency, especially if you're talking about aging. So if you're talking about age-related diseases, on the other hand, like if you pick single diseases like Alzheimer's diseases or, or the like, then there's even a bit greater urgency also on speeding up translation. At least this is also what regulators are talking about, how to speed up um, the translation from the basic research findings into drugs, into therapies on age-related diseases. And also there's a regulatory issue, like for example in uh, Japan and in South Korea, as far as I know, they have a kind of fast-track 
regulation, for example, on regenerative medicine and stem cell therapies. So there's actually a kind of shortcut regulation so that they can um, be approved in a faster time. I, I don't have much to add to, I, I agree with much of what's been said. A, a, a few things though, you know, when you talk about the long time frame that would be required for testing efficacy of, of um, you know, drugs that would extend lifespan, I mean, I would again return to the idea that aging and disease is really the same thing. Um, and so, you know, thinking of biomarkers of aging, the best biomarkers are the diseases themselves. So in terms of testing, I, I mean, I think, um, you know, in terms of um, how, how difficult or easy it would be, I think a lot would depend on whether you are dealing with drugs that have acute effects on the development of pathologies that are already in the, in the process of developing. Uh, and certainly some of the drugs that are being in, tested at the moment, like rapamycin, do appear to behave that way. So uh, that would open the, the possibility that, for example, if you were to you know, look at uh, people who are at very high risk of developing pathologies over a relatively short time span, so people in their 80s, for example, and you would, you know, if you were to look at uh, effects on a, a number of different pathologies over a period of, let's say, a couple of years, I would have thought uh, it would be possible to detect effects in that way. I do think that what would make things a lot easier would be more information about mechanism, about mechanisms of how the pathology, you know, the biology of the pathologies that are developing and how the drugs are acting on those pathologies. And it would make it much easier to know what exactly to look for, what exactly to monitor, um, so you're not sort of taking pot shots into the dark. Um, Maybe I will complement. I have started on purpose with very basic things. You have the standard way and the non-standard way. Actually, there is a lot of in-between happening. Uh, so if we take, for example, uh, rapamycin, the rapalox, the verolimus. Uh, so it's um, Novartis, uh, John Manick, who has a, a led a clinical trial um, to improve the response to flu vaccine. Uh, because... Uh, um, rapamycin and uh, similar uh, um, molecules, uh, they do a lot of things in the body. Um, the explanation isn't necessarily obvious. I might think that it's in fact uh, doing some kind of um, a stimulation of the regenerative processes of the body after some time. But that's one point of view. Uh, but it appears that the immune system is a bit uh, stimulated after some time. And uh, indeed, so what they did, sorry to be fast, um, so maybe most of you know here, but most of the people don't know, aged persons, they don't usually respond well to the flu vaccine. It doesn't work because the, they are old, their immune system is old. Uh, I make it very simple and it just doesn't work. Uh, so that's a big issue. Um, and uh, so there is a big pressure to improve the responsiveness to flu vaccines, especially when governments buy a lot of them. Um, and so uh, they, they go into that avenue, uh, but in fact the, the, the probable goal when we know the people who are leading this project is that um, a lot of the, the people in the population take rapamycin for their flu shot, even though they want it for their health in general. So sometimes we can find some tricks and play and not declare everything that we think uh, in order to go faster for delivery. Also, the polypill is another, uh, I would say it's a counter example. A polypill is more like the Kazakhstan uh, thing where we are able to convince the government to take a, a large step forward uh, because the polypill in the UK, uh, everyone um, aged 50 or 55, I don't know, or more, uh, can uh, call and, uh, and uh, be part of a very large clinical trial where a mixture of, uh, of uh, small doses of drugs that are given in case of cardiovascular um, conditions are given. Uh, and on paper, uh, it is to be supposed to be very good for health. And they have tested with some clinical trials that the polypill indeed, uh, it was done I think in India, uh, improves the biomarkers. But no one knows for sure that it's going to uh, improve mortality. And we've seen with uh, uh, various cardiovascular drugs, that improving the biomarker doesn't mean that you improve health. 
uh, and lifespan. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so, so those are two a bit extreme examples. So, I, I yes, yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I, I actually would like to add, uh, add uh, that it's, in, in my view, not only an issue on aging, it's, it's a question about the length of um, the time it um, takes from discovery to uh, application within pharmaceutical uh, but also medical devices. So it's, it's a general question uh, one needs to ask, which are, uh, you know, how long does it necessarily need to take in order to also have a, a safe and validated product? On the other hand, like which technologies, say digitization especially, but also lab automation and other technologies could, for example, speed up the um, time for drug discovery or um, the, the, the time for validation and testing. So one could actually calculate, you know, how much <coughs> could actually be saved and which time goes um, through um, administration or, or other inefficient efforts. So I, I don't really know which, which time length is really necessary and which time length is just due to inefficiency. So um, Edouard already mentioned one clinical trial with rapamycin, but another one very famously last year was the metformin, the TAME trial. Uh, and in that trial that I already mentioned yesterday, they took 3,000, or they are going to take 3,000 um, elderly people who are at high risk for age-related diseases, and then they are going to put them on metformin for five to seven years, and then after that they are going to evaluate mortality and also the incidence of age-related <coughs> diseases. What do you think about this type of method where you, where you basically rather than taking, quote-unquote, healthy elderly people, instead take people who are already at very high risk for disease, who don't have the disease yet, and see if it does anything, your intervention. <coughs> is that a good design? Is that... But isn't the metformin trial a bit of a different story because it's, it has already been a, a compound that has already been approved just for, for, for another class of a disease. So isn't this a, a bit of a different story than if you, for example, want to test a totally new drug or totally new therapy or compound that has not been approved already? Yes, that definitely is true. So there is a lot of, you know, people who are doing drug repurposing because you skip the fact that you have to prove the safety of the drug. The drug is already approved for human use. So, yeah, and, and um, I, I think in this way the metformin trial on elderly could actually also have been a trial on um, testing, you know, how, how, how well the, the drug works with the elderly population. And there's also some kind of bias, at least as I have um, understood, in regard to drug testing, that it's um, that the elderly population is often a bit um, underrepresented. So the younger population also, like children, but that is changing because they're saying, okay, children's metabolism and physiology is different, so you need also to include children into the uh, the tests, the clinical trials. But with with elderly, it's not that established to have them, you say, how to say, on a regular basis. I, can I just, I don't quite understand the question. So are you asking whether, um, whether one should only be looking at completely healthy subjects, whether, whether one should be excluding unhealthy subjects? from these trials, is that, that no, what you're asking? No, um, no, my question with the team trial was, what do you think about the design of the trial where you take people who are at high risk so that you reduce the period of time needed to yeah. get the results? Yeah. 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 Maybe, I, will, I guess I, I'm here for one reason, but it's not uh, fully official yet, so I'm in a, in a process. Uh, we are we're trying to go from research to uh, human, 
Um, and so we, we are going to develop a platform where researchers will propose uh, uh, and we will be handling a fund and acceleration mechanism um, to go from one side to the other. Uh, and in part uh, of it, uh, we are going through data analysis uh, to uh, repurpose drugs in a large scale, because that's indeed the fastest way to go. We have some drugs that are already approved uh, with the toxicity uh, trials done, and so we simply need to simply uh, need to find another indication. It's never easy, um, a and so on. Uh, but even for that, uh, in fact, what we do is we use the the, the data of the historical. Uh, uh, well, a lot of people, millions of people already took those drugs, and so we do observe with some time of maybe 10 years, if the drug is 10 years old at least, we observe what the drugs does on the long term in the data. We cannot test, uh, I mean, the, the metformin clinical trial, it's, uh, it's very expensive. I think it's uh, what? 50 uh, million dollars. Yes, 50 or 30 or 50 million uh, dollars. Uh, that's very, very expensive. So uh, for uh, the whole, I would say, uh, economic, for the, the chain, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, it will be difficult to push that for the governments also. Uh, it's just not, it's just too high compared to usual standards. Uh, so I think here it's done because it's something exceptional. It's the first time we are really dealing with prevention in, in a large, not the first time because we have the poly pill, but it's something a lot of people believe in. But it's probably not the most, uh, I, I don't view it as the, the standard. Can I, can I make a question, please? Um, maybe, is it about this immediately yeah, or? Uh, okay. You. So what about uh, one of the most gigantic uh, experiments that uh, has ever been done? There are millions of people uh, taking uh, um, uh, statins and also aspirin, aspirin low, low dose aspirin. These are potentially extremely important. So it's, it's, a, it's a gigantic experiment all over the world. Can you exploit the data of this experiment? Yes, and actually, so the data, I, there are already re, uh, articles about that. Uh, I don't have the names in my head, but uh, I have read them. Uh, and regarding uh, aspirin, so we have uh, a lot of years in the US especially where uh, small doses of aspirin were given and where we do see reductions in cardiovascular mortality, but also, all, well, there are some debates on how to analyze the data. Also general uh, mortality, all-cause mortality. Uh, for statins, we also do find it, and there were some uh, first article that concluded that there was uh, uh, no uh, decrease of mortality or some increase, and they answered later, oh, sorry, we, we did not analyze correctly, it does decrease mortality risk um, overall. Uh, so there is some data already analyzed and published uh, uh, on those aspects. Uh, it's historical data. Um, uh, I've discussed with some regulators. Um, they uh, don't necessarily feel that it's always necessary to perform a clinical trial. Uh, this is the standard for the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, but that's a, it's still a very uh, gray zone uh, because in the end the regulator has to accept and uh, it's, you never know in advance uh, what is needed. So it's difficult to say for sure we need this or this or that. What I was saying in the end is that the, the TAME study is very expensive. Uh, so usually uh, people would try to find another way, a much cheaper way to get it to the market and will uh, wait for years and data to be collected to uh, ensure that it works. Can I make a couple of remarks? I mean, in, in terms of the TAME study, I'm still not quite sure I understand about the business of the risk status of the patients. I mean, clearly, if these are patients, if these are subjects who are diabetic, then it doesn't make a lot no, of sense. No, no. Uh, they have other kinds of health issues. Or I think they excluded all the yeah, diabetics. Okay. It's in so if they're just generally people with of high risk in, in terms of other health aspects, like for, uh, risk for cancer or something, then that would be good because you presumably be more likely to get uh, 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 detect effects. I mean, one thing I would also comment is, you know, you're talking about a five to seven year project, but if these, are, if these drugs are having acute effects, one might well, in quite early stages of, of, of you know, interim 
uh, uh, examination of the data, be able to pick things up and to be able to build further studies on that. I think one, we, one needn't necessarily have to wait for the whole duration to be able to draw conclusions. But um, just to add to something, maybe you were going to or ask a separate question about this. It's something that Miriam, you were saying. I mean, I, my own suspicion here is that once any of this, once any, there are any uh, clear positive findings for any of these treatments, and that gets out into the public domain, I suspect that the strength of feeling in the public, you know, wanting to see results from this will be very, very strong indeed. And the standards that exist, you know, which are very, very well-intentioned standards, which are actually, I think, being somewhat obstructed from the pharmaceutical industry, there may be, you know, I think there'll be a, a strong desire to find all kinds of ways to get around them in order to speed things up. You know, I mean, at the moment, I, I agree, there's, there's a complete lack of urgency. You know, the medical field, aging is not even a disease, it's just normal. So there's a sense that there is no crisis. You yeah. know, but it is a crisis. People are dying in vast numbers, you know, from what Every is potentially day. preventable. Yeah. Um, so I think things could change very quickly. To, to exchange on that, myself, I thought there would be a crisis just with the mice that were living longer, but people don't care about mice. And I thought there would be a, a crisis when I saw the, the data published from the UK, where people who have diabetes and are treated with uh, metformin, they happen, at least in the first years of the disease, because then there are complications, um, to, be, to have less mortality than non-diabetics. Uh, and of course, those who are not treated with metformin but with something else, they have a high mortality rate. But those who are so it means that uh, metformin is stronger than diabetes somehow. Uh, is a, so, so that's a very impressive result. And in fact, we have even similar uh, analyses that are published uh, from uh, uh, um, uh, electronic health records in the US with people having cancers and those who uh, were taking metformin, they have longer survival, but they also have lower incidence of cancer, etc. So millions of people, uh, they are big data, I would say, really, and it didn't make the crisis. So we need that, indeed, uh, expensive, uh, tame trial to, to change the minds, uh, indeed. So it seems that we still have a, way, a long way to go with clinical trials and so on, at least to convince. I think that uh, during uh, next year, 2017, especially, um, uh, definitely it will happen in 2018, uh, there w will appear at least two specific uh, laboratories hubs, one in Silicon Valley and second in the UK, and probably third in uh, Singapore. Uh, this uh, complex of uh, laboratories, they will give um, plat so-called platform solutions for companies uh, which are doing some uh, different a range of uh, preventive uh, treatments. And uh, they will give uh, possibility uh, and format uh, to, for such companies, such uh, startups, uh, maybe scientists, to do experiments in advanced, at the same time, credible way. Uh, in such way that uh, Big Pharma and uh, other sites uh, will recognize these experiments uh, in, let's say, in um, better and optimized way. Uh, second, I'm sure that uh, during maximum two years, there uh, will appear at least two countries which will return their uh, law system specifically for uh, biomedicine, biotech industry, and uh, companies from Silicon Valley, from UK, from Europe will move there. And uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, one of that countries will be one of islands which is in, um, which is um, among UK, uh, UK, United Kingdom unions. So there are something like 11 countries, formally as a country, but actually they are under umbrella of UK. And probably uh, something, uh, something similar will appear in Asia, somewhere close to Singapore in that region. So they, this, uh, <clears throat> and uh, more of it, uh, in previous uh, decades, there was competition among um, poor countries which transformed themselves into offshore, offshore countries and uh, they tried to attract a lot of um, different uh, weird people uh, for promoting the concept of money laundering, yes? So, <clears throat> and I'm sure that in, in close coming years, there will appear 
uh, other types of countries and other types of uh, law systems which will compete between each other to create the, be uh, the best ecosystems for biotech companies and to, to give them a uh, possibility to make, um, to create, uh, they will definitely, they, first of all, they will create a new system for, um, <clears throat> let's say, architecture of clinical trials, which will be credible enough, because in case of uh, Kazakhstan, for example, uh, I don't think that Kazakhstan is too much, uh, too enough credible for other countries, for, for example, for, Europe, uh, for Western countries to be recognized as good environment for clinical trials. Uh, the same situation is uh, in China, because uh, just today I read an article uh, the Chinese officials, they made uh, internal investigation and found out that uh, approximately 80% of their clinical trials were false and artificially, uh, let's say, they made kind of, uh, <laughs> you know, tricky game with uh, results. Uh, so um, there, should, uh, there should appear a couple of countries, small countries, kind of islands, which will create uh, uh, the best environment for all that companies, scientists, and uh, startups uh, to make their uh, <coughs> clinical trials and also t uh, maybe uh, just there will, uh, will be created uh, new types of uh, clinics. Uh, for example, of course, you know, uh, nucleus of uh, human longevity uh, and uh, Craig Venter, yes? So, they promote this clinic as uh, number one in the world. And actually, but at the same time, uh, most of uh, things that probably they, they would like to do, they cannot do uh, formally, just because uh, of the fact that the US is the most uh, regulated country in the world. And uh, that's why the most advanced clinics cannot appear in the US. They will appear somewhere else. And, uh, <clears throat> but, I, but I'm sure that uh, within two, three, four years, they, they will appear great competition between also uh, advanced clinics, uh, which will uh, appear on such islands, and uh, not somewhere in Central America, but somewhere uh, closer, let's say, in, in North Atlantic Ocean, in such region, maybe somewhere near Singapore. So th this is my kind of predictions, forecasting, and uh, some of them are based on some knowledge which I have about these projects. But uh, <clears throat> uh, the scientists who are in, in, in this field, uh, they should uh, also start to think in, in the context that uh, not big pharma probably will dictate new, uh, the longevity industry will be not uh, created by big pharma. The longevity industry, new longevity industry will be created by other players, probably by governments of uh, small but dynamic countries <clears throat> smart countries, maybe such as uh, Singapore or Hong Kong. Uh, at the same time, probably by IT giants, such as Facebook, IBM, Google, and so on. Uh, and more of it. I'm sure that uh, during just next year, at least two projects uh, in the form of uh, platform IT solutions will appear. So one of them uh, probably will be somehow related with uh, Eduard, and uh, second will be uh, related with blockchain community because uh, blockchain uh, technology is now booming. And at the same time, uh, you should know that in blockchain industry, there are a lot of uh, uh, wealthy, uh, intelligent, but at the same time, uh, people. At the same time, uh, a lot of them are interested in the longevity topic. So uh, <clears throat> using blockchain technologies and uh, the ideology of uh, decentralization, uh, I'm sure that during next year they will appear at least one uh, international uh, big super platform which will give uh, possibility for scientists and uh, uh, biotech companies to make different uh, trials and experiments, not in traditional way, but at the same time uh, in very uh, validated way. So I mean that everything which will be done in humans, it will be, uh, it can be uh, analyzed and uh, confirmed by independent uh, uh, 
analysts and uh, maybe investigators. So not to repeat, uh, because uh, if to go back to uh, so-called traditional form of clinical trials, in case of China, we see that this is absolutely weird uh, system now. Then uh, when 80% uh, of clinical trials are uh, uh, absolutely false. Uh, did he have a question? Well, actually, it's more a few remarks, so, and you can react, of course. Uh, the, the, the first remark is, uh, I think it's absolutely necessar necessary if you have such a test that you have double blind tests, uh, because otherwise you will have, once again, like uh, we see uh, very often, uh, very spectacular results, but they will not be confirmed. That's the first aspect. The second aspect, uh, I think one of the things that we need is uh, healthy volunteers, more or less old healthy volunteers, uh, like you and me, <laughs> uh, or you. <laughs> okay, that's the second aspect. Uh, the third aspect, uh, I'm, okay, I would love to be wrong, but I'm uh, convinced that uh, pro products like metformin uh, and uh, rapamycin and all other, all other products uh, they are not going to give big results and uh, polypill and so on. Okay, uh, so we need to go uh, further for gene therapy and for other aspects. And maybe uh, the the last uh, remark is okay. It's great that there are uh, companies uh, in involved, but it's also very important to try to uh, involve more and to convince public institutions. <laughs> Uh, because uh, otherwise people will be uh, afraid, that's one aspect, and also because there, there is a lot of money and there is a lot of organization, but I know there are a lot of, <clears throat> there are many problems, with, but we have to convince these institutions to test faster, and if they want, they can do it. Okay, but you have certainly reactions to this. I Thank suppose you. we all, all of us agree, absolutely. Well, uh, of course, we cannot wait for 30 years in human lifespan intervention tests, but I should say that there is already um, some uh, clinically significant uh, biomarkers, and one of them is frailty index. There, are, there is a number of them, perhaps about five of them, uh, but they correlate uh, well with uh, some parameters of mortality, morbidity, in many cases better than ages. Aging. And it is um, already uh, well established and at uh, clinicaltrials.gov uh, there, uh, there are a number of clinical trials which have this frailty index as endpoint. So basically it, it is happening already. Uh, there are drugs uh, tested uh, for aging in its uh, later phase. We just need to keep on developing the system of biomarkers, uh, perhaps uh, more advanced, and uh, those which show aging processes at earlier age. And uh, recently there have been published a number of papers uh, which uh, calculate <laughs> uh, by statistical analysis and deep learning methods uh, uh, biomarkers which correlate with uh, aging, with mortality, from retrospective analysis of previous clinical studies, of observational studies, and there seems to be that there is some consensus emerging because this group come not to completely different lists, but to similar lists. So we just have to perhaps uh, wait until established system of aging biomarker is developed, and then uh, uh, build consensus around it and promote it as, uh, to be as established and well recognized as frailty index. And then we can just test drugs for aging. Thank you. Maybe also uh, it could be part of the discussion that uh, ICD-11, you know, uh, there is a code for diseases. Each disease has a code. And uh, uh, when you patent, as it was explained this morning, uh, a drug, it's for an indication. And that indication, it's usually within a list. And uh, there is no disease called aging in that list, right? Uh, not today. Uh, so there is a disease called the senescence in that list. 
although it's a bit uh, special. And so uh, people like uh, Daria are part of a project to, uh, so it's, uh, we are going to go from a list of disease that is called ICD-10 to a list of disease that is called ICD-11. So it's, it's not going to be done in one week, but it's going to be done over the next two years, probably, uh, because uh, the agenda has changed. And so you may want to go to icd11.org, uh, which is a website where you can participate and uh, uh, give ideas on uh, what uh, new types of disease should be formulated. And ideally, like what we did for, like uh, what is happening with, uh, with Everolimus and the flu vaccine, uh, if we can find some, uh, uh, if you have some clear ideas of ways to go fast uh, towards aging, uh, then it should be discussed there because uh, the goal is to have the, uh, the pharmaceutical industry uh, develop solutions for such diseases. Um, wait, I had first a question by Victor and then we come to you and Mark. Yeah, um, I was thinking, what do you think about the uh, uh, movements like uh, quantified self, to what extent do you think citizens can take their health in their own hands and develop online communities to, to see uh, how what they do affect their health and that could uh, accelerate what we know from their protective trials and so on? So I'm sure uh, the progress will uh, absolutely uh, will go in that direction. The progress of uh, uh, aggregating data and aggregating the, uh, let's say, good data, not uh, different weird and uh, no structured data. And also, uh, they will appear, uh, I'm sure that uh, during uh, close coming years, they will appear and emerge uh, a lot of new IT technologies which will boost uh, such uh, communities, such initiatives uh, for crowdsourcing and using uh, also human bodies as uh, experimental platforms, and uh, maybe it will uh, it will be even become a, a huge business and new, let's say, new industry, because uh, uh, I'm sure that in China and another in, in India, a lot of people would like uh, to participate in such programs if uh, they would be somehow commercialized. Uh, this, this could also even improve, you know, the definition of, of certain parameters or biomarkers related to aging. So if you cannot say that aging as such is the disease, you could at least um, define a, a bunch of parameters that, that are actually related to aging. And if you constantly monitor these parameters and you see some improvement or some deterioration, then it could be an indication that actually the, the compound or the therap therapy had uh, some positive effect. But uh, I, I think we also need to invest more in data analytics. Like nowadays, it's quite easy to measure data, quite easy to generate data, but I think we, we also need to invest more in analytics and validation of all this data. Claudio? Well, I think that this question is very critical, the classification, because uh, uh, for two main reasons, the actual, the, the present classification is totally wrong. Uh, first of all, because uh, the more we study, the more we realize that uh, age-related diseases uh, share the same uh, basic mechanism. So the clinics is something, but uh, Apparently, the diseases are so different and so many, but the, the, there is a, a sort of uh, mechanistic unification at the basis. So, uh, diseases that are apparently clinically very different share the, the same basic uh, mechanism. The second is that uh, according to some biomarkers, which are uh, a uh, combination of biomarkers, there are people uh, at a relatively young age, say around uh, 35 or 40, uh, that uh, have a, a biological age with the available biomarker much uh, uh, higher. 
So how to define these people? They are not frail. So the definition of frailty is, cannot be used for these people because apparently they are quite healthy from a cognitive point of view for the mobility is okay, but they are uh, in a, a sort of a pre-aging uh, pre status that uh, only now start becoming to be defined according to this combination of biomarker, which of course uh, can be <coughs> improved. So I think that it could be very interesting to think about uh, of a new uh, entity, a new definition, a sort of pre, uh, pre senescence, pre something, uh, in order to when you uh, identify a new. Um, situation in medicine, uh, you have to give a name. So it is urgent to give a name to this situation which has never been predicted in the past uh, because there were no tools to, uh, to quantify. But now and in the future, uh, this, uh, this quantification of the early uh, aging, say, and so an early increase, a high um, increase the risk of development uh, um, all the age-related diseases is now uh, starting to be available uh, and so we have to create a new classification and also to put together different di diseases that are, are apparently <coughs> different but uh, for example Alzheimer and diabetes share a lot of uh, of a mechanism and the people uh, think about diabetes type 3 because uh, insulin resistance and the glucose metabolism is involved uh, heavily in both. So we are in a strange uh, period because, uh, critical period, because most of what is written in a medical textbook is probably wrong. <coughs> So maybe just to answer, I think this is totally the point of ICD11.org. Uh, so it's an initiative that for now is started by some volunteers and uh, there might be, uh, I don't know, like 10 heavily involved volunteers. I think it needs to be taken to another level, perhaps by other people. Uh, but it's happening now because, the, you know, there are rules and the institutions are like that. So they want a new ICD. Um, it's going to be difficult to change everything, so we have to find uh, within the system how to do. For <laughs> so, for example, you know, senescence, one, uh, I'm just saying, but this is not decided at all for now, we could define um, uh, senescent thymus, because uh, when we are old, we don't have a big thymus, and that could be a disease, because some people could have, when they are young, uh, a small thymus, for example. We could have uh, senescent proteins, meaning they are protein aggregates, or uh, we could try to define something that correspond to rare diseases and also to aging, and uh, such things, and that are general uh, in aging. Uh, so this is what is being uh, one of the possible uh, discussions. So ICD11.org. So, but it's generally also often an issue like, for example, if, if some symptoms associated with aging would um, appear in, in a younger person, then it um, would probably get treated and, and, and people would say um, this, this is a diseased state, but at, at some point they just say it's, it's age and so they often don't care about it and see it in, in, in a totally different way as if the person would have been younger and maybe it's even a kind of age discrimination thing. <laughs> uh, I am working on uh, a, <clears throat> some gene that uh, um, play a role in uh, practically all metabolic diseases and we have uh, results from uh, knockout mice that uh, indeed this can be the case. So it could be interesting to have a definition like uh, not a metabolic uh, disease in the old sense, but uh, diseases of metabolism, uh, dysregulation of metabolism, early dysregulation of metabolism, for example, so <clears throat> that you can pinpoint uh, uh, this type of uh, <clears throat> early changes which uh, can cover a sort of umbrella 
not of a single disease, because this is the point. Uh, the definition of single disease is totally inadequate for age-related diseases, totally inadequate. So we need a, a sort of uh, a trick, uh, a, a, um, a definition which is a sort of trick to, co to cover uh, as an umbrella many uh, um, diseases that uh, uh, that share mechanistic uh, and uh, commonalities uh, but are not defined at the clinical level because uh, in the textbook we follow and we 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 teach to the to the students the old definition that uh, that uh, was defined uh, several centuries ago uh, according to this uh, slide uh, so the idea is how we can boost up and i will explain also one of uh, methods which we are using in our practice. Um, we as in the investment fund, we prefer to invest in the companies uh, which uh, founders are, uh, are somehow using their technologies on their, their bodies. And uh, this is one of, uh, let's say, approaches. Um, second, we Farik Javaronkov, who is CEO of uh, in Silicon Medicine Company, and also trustee of uh, Biogenetology Research Foundation. And actually, he started to take uh, Giro Protectors, uh, I suppose, eight years ago already, and uh, uh, making different experiments from himself. So we, uh, one year and a half ago, we made longevity bet with him. And uh, uh, this bet will start uh, in 2079, when he will be 100 years and I will be 100 free at that time. <clears throat> and uh, this, uh, I suppose that uh, when we will achieve uh, the level that uh, biomarkers will be really confirmed and there will be a real good list of biomarkers of aging, probably they, they will appear, uh, you know, new kind of uh, game industry to make bets on different people and uh, who will uh, use different technologies and uh, it will be if uh, we'll have possibility to measure in real time their biomarkers. So it will uh, can lead, you know, to new uh, gaming industry, but for uh, where people really will compete uh, how to use uh, different approaches, di different technologies, different geoprotectors and so on. So how do they know whether their longevity has anything to do with the geoprotectors they're taking? I mean, surely this all you generate is anecdotal uh, information. I mean, it's a good way to <coughs> raise money, maybe. But <coughs> so, yeah. so look. Uh, generally, there is community of people uh, which are uh, doing uh, self experiments. But uh, the problem that uh, this is uh, there is no technologies how to validate and how to confirm. Uh, what I'm uh, saying that uh, during next year, such technologies they will appear because uh, uh, we can predict. Uh, some progress which will happen in uh, IT industry. I mean, because uh, it's not so, so difficult to, to predict what will happen with uh, uh, blockchain technologies, with artificial intelligence, and so on. So, uh, and about this gamification, uh, gamification is uh, one of the uh, main um, core systems of all marketing industry. And uh, it is used heavily in fintech industry. So, uh, Advertising is uh, built on gamification in uh, engagement of uh, participants to participate. So in uh, with longevity uh, industry, we have lack of uh, participation because of a lot of people are somehow talking about it, but uh, very few are doing something on practice. Uh, so this uh, new, let's say, not new, old technologies, which were invented, for example, 10 years ago, five years ago, one year ago, and uh, being applied already uh, efficiently in other industries. So I suppose they will be repurposed uh, during uh, close coming years for longevity industry. And uh, <coughs> it will help also scientists and also, let's say, different uh, parties to, you know, to have some benefits. And uh, actually, uh, one of good examples how it, happening, uh, how it happens in, in one sub-sphere uh, which is related with uh, longevity. Uh, now, uh, there, there are really a rise of so-called edge tech 
edge tech, it means it is similar to fintech or biotech uh, or different martech, for example. Uh, so it, it means that uh, new IT technologies, first of all, a different kind of uh, uh, integration with um, smartphones, uh, they start uh, they uh, starts to be used <coughs> to involve all people who are now switched off from society and not, uh, not active consumers, but have uh, money at the same time. So to switch them back uh, into active uh, society. And uh, for fintech industry, for example, it is interesting because uh, they will become just new clients. And uh, as we know, there, uh, there is no, now there is so-called uh, silver tsunami. So there is at least one billion of people around the globe which are switched off from uh, being active uh, consumers. But uh, these new types of technologies, uh, they're switching them back to active uh, consumers. So this is edge tech, and actually in the US, in Silicon Valley, there are uh, now uh, regular conferences on this topic. And I suppose that uh, in Europe, uh, there, there also will be a rise of this industry. More of it, in the uh, European Union, uh, I suppose here in Brussels, there is uh, platform, IT platform, which is just, uh, Victor, can you remind me the name of that uh, platform mm, created by European Union? I suppose it is not active, but uh, it is created. Edge yes, edge platform. So in the European Union, uh, we have uh, edge platform. It is a uh, formal project, which is created by European uh, Union. And I suppose that uh, we uh, should try uh, to help them to improve this platform because it is uh, created. I don't know how it is, uh, how things are going on, how, how well they are. Okay. About um, passing from bench to bedside, I was uh, wondering what do you think about the, the last possibilities uh, uh, which are coming from uh, bioprinting, 3D bioprinting. Um, is these possibilities to have, uh, for example, uh, a synthetic uh, skin, uh, synthetic uh, uh, follicular glands for hair, which uh, I just read, uh, um, uh, um, business, uh, some uh, L'Oreal just put uh, a lot of money uh, uh, with um, Organovo for um, synthetic skin, or with uh, Poietis for uh, synthetic uh, hair. Um, uh, is this um, uh, um, a way to, to test uh, or to, to have something between the mouse and the human, uh, for example, um, from the, the clinical point of view? Uh, and is it possible to, to test, for example, uh, uh, aging markers on such uh, uh, synthetic um, uh, human uh, tissues? And from the, uh, the financial uh, problems, uh, because I, say, I saw that... Uh, um, even if it comes from a, a public researcher, for example, uh, the guy is from Poietis, uh, is from the University of uh, Bordeaux, but uh, at the end, uh, this is uh, L'Oreal who gave the, the money. Uh, so what, what do you think? Is this a, a way uh, which could be useful? Yeah, actually, in, in general, um, testing um, um, drugs in, in um, um, tissue cultures, it's actually increasingly uh, advocated and, and pushed in regard to uh, research and development. But the, the, the point actually comes rather from the animal testing side to um, decrease the number of animal tests so that you can actually test um, medication and drugs in, in cell cultures, which is also more reliable in, in specific conditions because then you have, can have human um, cell cultures or um, cultures of, of human organ cells instead of an animal model where you still need to then the translation of the, the animal to, to the human. So actually this is something where the interest is growing, where the, the technology is improving, and this could actually be something to, to further push also in, in, in regard to possibly cutting short. Yeah, I, I would very strongly echo that. I mean, as someone working on C. elegans, there's a, you know, the, where I work, we have C. elegans, we have Drosophila, we have yeast, you know, and there's some cell culture work. 
But the, the big problem is then whatever you discover, we have so much flexibility, but as soon as you want to move on to mouse, the costs go, they skyrocket. So there's a, that's been a problem for years is, is the need for models that are, that are affordable and practical that, that you know, don't have these enormous costs. So things like uh, being able to create small organs on, on, on sort of artificial skin and these, these kinds of models, if they're controllable, I, th I think, you know, they could really uh, allow things to, to speed up. I mean, the mouse, the, the problem of the mouse as a, you know, as a model is it's really a huge bottleneck in terms of progress in, in, in the biogerontology. I will, I will moderate, but maybe I will be wrong, I don't know. Uh, if we go from mice to people, we again, uh, the cost skyrocket again, right? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so if we want to go fast, and also, let's say you want to test something on aging in people, it's not in the past data because it's not something that people have been doing before. Uh, you need to wait for 30 years. Uh, so the mice, it's a model, but at least it's uh, three years or two years if you start a bit uh, uh, with aged mice already. Uh, and uh, just to take some, just an example to, to, to make it uh, clear in the attention of everyone, um, someone regrew his uh, thymus, I was giving that example, uh, he would not have done it on himself if, he, if it hadn't been done before clearly in, in rodents. Uh, so uh, at, you, you still need some some platform to 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 evolve and uh, and uh, yes and and we are not there yet where data is sufficient to do all data or whatever new uh, nanotech or system. Okay, I think we are going to conclude here. Now I would like to add that for several years, uh, for the symposium, one of the ideas had been to have some type of discussion or lectures on new model organisms for aging. And you brought it up now, and I think that's the ideal thing for next time. And with that, I would like to invite you already back for the next conference, right, where we will discuss the new models. Um, and so this ends uh, the day, and this also ends the biology of aging part. Tomorrow, we will switch gears